Good afternoon, members. We'll call the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development uh, to order. It is Wednesday, excuse me, it's Monday, right? It feels like Wednesday, doesn't it? At least for me, anyway. Uh, it is Monday, uh, January 30th. Um, we do have a quorum. A quorum is present. And thank you, audience, for your patience, because we were in, as you could tell, in session, and then immediately, once we laid that bill on the table there on the Senate floor, we made it over here. So just so you know that we have a couple bills that we're going to hear today, uh, but first is going to be Senate File 73 on cannabis, as well as we're going to hear Senate File 359. Uh, 367 and 355. So we have a full agenda. We're going to move expeditiously, but we're going to give each bill the uh, necessary time to give us a real sense of what that bill is all about, okay? Um, so with that being said, I am always excited to have Senator Port uh, with us, who is the author of Senate File Number 73. Uh, so Senator Port, Senator Port, welcome to the committee, and you can start off, you know, giving us any uh, 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 thing that you want us to know, introductory comments before we have Senate Council go through the bill, but we'll take your lead on that. Senator, uh, Senator Port. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Champion and committee members. I'm really pleased to be here with you to present Senate File 73, the Adult Use Cannabis Legalization Bill. Prohibition of cannabis is a failed system that has not achieved the desired goals and has had incredible costs for our communities, especially for communities of color. We have an opportunity today to move forward in the process to undo some of the harm that has been done and to create a system of regulation that works for Minnesota consumers and businesses while ensuring an opportunity in this new market for communities that have been most affected by prohibition. Our main goals are to legalize, regulate, and expunge, and we're working to ensure this bill does just that. The bill establishes an Office of Cannabis Management to oversee the regulation of cannabis and transfers the medical cannabis program to that new office. It establishes a Cannabis Advisory Council, requires specific studies and reports, and sets up a statewide monitoring system. The bill also creates an approval process for cannabis and hemp-derived consumer products, establishes plant propaganda propagation standards and agricultural best practices, as well as environmental standards. Additionally, the bill provides legal limits for adult use cannabis products, establishes 14 categories of licensing and related fees and legal framework. We establish a social equity program to ensure communities most harmed by prohibition have an opportunity to engage in the industry, provide grower grants, and invest in a substance use disorder advisory council. Senate File 73 sets the tax rate for cannabis products, provides business development grants programs, sets up an automatic expungement program, as well as an expungement panel for higher level offenses, and puts in temporary regulation guidelines, uh, changes for the products that we legalized last year. We also provide guidelines around testing, packaging, labeling, and advertising. This bill is comprehensive and we will absolutely have changes from now until it reaches the floor. In the next month or so, this bill will have a total of 18 committee stops. We hope that through this process, we can work together with each other and with stakeholders to get a final product that works best for Minnesotans. Today, in the Jobs and Economic Development Committee, the jurisdictions cover primarily Article 3, which, is estab which establishes four grant programs, three of which are administered by deed and thus covered by this committee. They are the CAN Startup, CAN Navigate, and CAN Train programs. The CAN Startup program consists of grants for nonprofit organizations to establish a revolving loan fund for businesses that seek to operate in the cannabis industry. Loans would be for up to $150,000 and would be partially or wholly forgi forgivable in three years. These loans are limited to businesses who would not be able to get into the cannabis uh, business without assistance. The CAN Navigate program consists of grants for nonprofits to help individuals navigate the cannabis regulatory system. These grants would apply to sectors of the cannabis industry outside of farmers and growers, such as processing and retail. The farmers and growers are covered in another grant program administered by the Department of Agriculture. Finally, the CAN Train program consists of grants to support individuals who want to work in the cannabis industry. Grants would be available for education eligible organizations that provide related training to individuals seeking uh, the industry. 
All three of these programs have a focus on social equity with an aim to help communities engage in this industry who have been most harmed by the prohibition on cannabis. I thank the committee for your time and look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Senator Port. And I want to recognize uh, Senator Umu Verbaden, who I see back there as well. And if I'm missing any other uh, member of this wonderful body, I want to make sure that I, I uh, pay, pay respect to them as well. Um, what I'm going to do, because you did sort of narrow it down to the places, the place of space where we are going to be, but I wanted to make sure I, I turn to Senate Council so she can kind of give us a, 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 a larger view as to what the bill is about, and then we'll come back to what is in this committee's jurisdiction. So with that being said, Ms. Dole Fontaine uh, can uh, walk through those things for us. Thank you so much, Senate Council. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. And Senator Port did a really nice job of going, th go going through Article 3, which has the three grant programs that would be run by the Department of Employment and Economic Development. There were just a couple of other things I wanted to point out in the bill that are, are somewhat related to the scope of this committee, and that would be um, in Article 1, uh, the Section 2 establishes the Office of Cannabis Management. management. And in particular, I just noted that one of the duties of the office is to promote economic growth with an emphasis on growth in areas that experience a disproportionate negative impact from cannabis prohibition. So there is um, an aspect of that office that will be looking at economic growth. Then in section three, that uh, the Cannabis Advisory Council is established. And there are probably about 30 members that will be on this council, but I wanted to also point out that the Commissioner of Employment and Economic Development will be uh, part of that council or a designee of the commissioner. And then there are no a number of experts from economic development uh, for minority and uh, business owners and other types of experts that are familiar with economic development that are part of that council. Then, as Senator Port mentioned in Article 3, that's really the primary, primary area of jurisdiction for this committee for jobs. And the three grant programs, um, which Senator Port mentioned, are the CAN Startup, the CAN Navigate, and the CAN Train grant programs. And then finally, in Article 9, Subdivision 7, this is where the money for the three grant programs is appropriated, and it's an unspecified amount in the bill right now. It would be from the general fund, and it would go to the Commissioner of Employment and Economic Development for the three grant programs that Senator Porton I described. Thanks so much. Thank you for that. Senator Port, does that sort of gel with your thinking? And is, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we go to the testifiers? That very much uh, confirms with, with my preparation for this committee. Um, so, nope, I don't have anything further. And before I go to the testifiers, one of the things that I did talk to Senator Port about and we will get together about it, is some of the licensing uh, notions and how that could, could have a sense of equity. Uh, and and uh, we will certainly talk about that, and she's been open to that. But that will not be the subject that is before this body. I just wanted to raise it so that individuals don't call me and say, hey, did you know, did you think about? And we will certainly do that. So thank you, Senator Port, for your, your understanding as far as that is concerned. So we'll have some people from the audience as well as on Zoom. And so I'm going to go through um, the list of testifiers. Just so we can go here, um, we will start with, and we'll give a couple minutes to Angela Dawson. She's a co-founder and president and CEO of Forty Acres Co-op, and it's my understanding she's going to be on Zoom. Uh, Miss uh, Dawson, are you there? I'm here. Good All afternoon. All right. I just I just want to make sure that we can hear you correctly. And as I often mention to everyone, whenever I'm doing these bigger hearings like this, I will be very strict around the time just because I want to make sure that we give everyone equal opportunity to be heard and to talk about things from their perspective. And we'll start that two minute clock once you start speaking. So for the record, if you'd be so kind as to say your name and where you're from and, and, and uh, please share your testimony with us. Ms. Dawson. Good afternoon, uh, Chair, and thank you, committee, for having me. My name is Angela Dawson. I am uh, president and CEO of the 40 Acre Cooperative and also a co-founder of The Great Rise. 40 Acre Cooperative is the first national black cooperative since the Reconstruction era and the only black indigenous 
farmer-led cooperative in our region. We create regional hubs that stimulate economic, social, and educational progress for farmers who have been left out of traditional agricultural programs. Um, and we provide uh, resources and support to help people all along the supply chain in agriculture, including uh, small business and entrepreneurial oper operations. I'm also affiliated with The Great Rise, which is Minnesota's first equity-based uh, cannabis advocacy organization. And we're working uh, to raise our voice for not only farmers, but also uh, people who have been most harmed by the prohibition of cannabis over the past few decades. Uh, we're all in support of smart uh, legalization in our state. Um, I did want to mention that I'm also, it's important that I mention my history here with uh, being a fourth generation farmer. And it's only important because I know there's certain agricultural programs that have been set aside uh, in the Department of Agriculture, but uh, farmers, uh, black and indigenous farmers specifically in the state have been left out of most agricultural programs. And, and the economic and educational um, barriers that we face and running our businesses are all across the spectrum. Up here in Pine County, Minnesota, where I farm, I have hired over the last two years of um, having my licensed hemp farm about 25 uh, rural neighbors here. And I mentioned I mentioned this because there's so much uh, in this state that we can be so proud of with our um, economic and steward, environmental stewardship. But there's a lot that we need to do here in terms of offering opportunities for ownership, land ownership, and um, a business ownership within this cannabis supply chain. All right. We thank you, Ms. Dawson. Uh, Ms. Dawson, you're, you're uh, two minutes is up, but you had some really rich things to say. Um, and I will go to the committee and see if there are any questions. If you have additional information that you want supplied to this committee or the author, please feel free to put that additional information in writing and submit it to us, and we will certainly make certain that it gets to the right place or space because we want you to be heard, okay? I thank you so much. I just want to say we care so much about our communities and the economy, and I appreciate your time. And um, to the committee, any questions for Ms. Dawson? Any questions for Ms. Dawson? Seeing none, thank you so very much, Ms. Dawson, and you have a fabulous day, and I hope that you'll continue to stay on with us. All right, I am now going to Sean Weber, and Sean Weber, is my understanding, is also on, oh, there you are. You are also on line. Sean Weber is the owner of Created River Cannabis Company and the president of Minnesota Hep Gro Hemp Growers Cooperative. Thank you for being with us. Two minutes, and again, the, the same invitation that I gave Ms. Dawson, uh, in the event that your comments are longer than the prescribed amount of time, feel free to submit that information and we'll certainly circulate it to the body. Uh, so with that being said, uh, welcome to the committee. Uh, state your name for the record and where you're from, and, and then go forward with your testimony. As soon as you start talking, we'll start our clock. Go ahead, Mr. Weber. Very good. Very good, thank you. My name is Sean Weber. Uh, I am the founder of Crested River Cannabis um, out in Morgan, Minnesota, which is about two and a half hours southwest of you um, uh, by Redwood Falls. I am also the president of the Minnesota Hemp Growers Co-op. Now, um, I appreciate you guys taking the time uh, to hear us out. Um, uh, I echo uh, everything that Angela stated, uh, but more I'm going to focus on the rural opportunities uh, revolving uh, this bill. Um, since I incorporated in 2019, um, I have five full-time employees. Uh, seasonally, we are up to 15 full-time employees. I could double my staff, but I am reluctant due to the uncertainty in the market. Um, I am more than confident that when this bill passes and, uh, we, um, and, and we continue on with our business plan, we will employ upwards to 35 people here in Morgan. Now that would make us the second largest employer in our small community, the largest being the local farm co-op. Um, so there, there are a lot of opportunities out there for jobs, even though we are one of the lowest unemployment states in the nation, um, it, it's, it's fascinating the number of calls I get for people looking for work specifically in this industry. So 
Uh, with the passage of, the, of this bill, uh, there'll be a, um, a significant economical opportunity in the rural uh, parts of the state, as well as increased employment. Uh, but furthermore, it's going to significantly help destigmatize any and all issues that we have on the true grain and agricultural side. Um, we, we, we have a lot of interested uh, row croppers, but they're very hesitant simply for because of the status of uh, cannabis as a whole. So um, that's what I wanted to share with the committee today. Um, I will yield my time back and be available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Weber, for that information. And again, if you want to put anything in writing, certainly feel free to do that. We sincerely uh, uh, welcome that. Mr. Chair? Uh, 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 Senator Nelson. Thank you. Uh, if we have questions for the uh, testifiers, would this be the appropriate time? It would be. Okay. M Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Senator Nelson. For our previous testifier. Absolutely. And I did, did state that, so make sure that you feel free to ask questions, because I'll ask right at the end of their testimony, uh, and then you can certainly ask questions. And Wait. I see that we have a couple questions. Senator Nelson. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, I, I was um, listening to your testimony about the destigmatization uh, of by legalizing marijuana and the, how that might help with some of the agricultural um, issues regarding, I, I believe you said, croppers who might be uh, who might be more likely to grow uh, a marijuana crop if it's not um, an illegal substance. But my question is. Um, it still remains a uh, Schedule I substance with the uh, FDA, the Federal Drug Administration. So my question is, how, uh, how would that, just taking it off of the Minnesota's, uh, 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 making it legal in Minnesota, how would that impact all of those um, potential growth or uh, ag uh, customers or growers who would still be under the federal government's ruling that this is a federal, a schedule one uh, addictive substance. So, um, so to the testifier, and then I'm wondering if the author or someone else might be able to answer that question in the event that a person wants to answer that as well. But, but Mr. Weber, go ahead. So I, I just want to make a slight clarification. I, I conflated two subjects. One is hemp and the other is marijuana. The, the, the legalization of marijuana at the state level will, will help the row croppers substantially in their interest in growing hemp as a product. And so we're talking about uh, agricultural hemp and the legal status of cannabis or marijuana as a whole. There's a lot of farmers that are hesitant to even grow hemp, regardless of its legal status, simply because it's compartmentalized with marijuana. Follow up, okay, you okay? Uh, uh, Senator uh, Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in the context of rural economic development, I think my question is likely for uh, Mr. Weber, but Ms. Dawson, if you have insight as well, I'd love it if you could share. Um, my question has to do with exactly what Mr. Weber was talking about, and that's uh, hemp and cannabis. Um, uh, in talking with a fair number of farmers, there's some confusion or concern about this bill having a different effect on hemp farmers versus cannabis farmers. I know that we're people are working these things out, but as long as you were here, uh, could you provide some insight about the impact on rural development and agriculture uh, from the perspective of both and a cannabis and a hemp farmer? Senator Port, or would you like Mr. Weber? Uh, Senator Putnam, would you like that? Who are you directing that question to? Uh, pro likely to Mr. Weber, but anyone okay, else who wants to right. talk about uh, it, that's cool too. Mr. Weber, to the question. Well, we, we anticipate that the agricultural opportunity is significant. And the big p part of the issue is the overall confusion. Uh, if we go back to when hemp was initially legalized for agricultural product in Minnesota, we had a significant influx of interested farmers. Unfortunately, they failed miserably simply because they didn't understand the varying genetics and output potentials of the crop. So uh, there is a substantial uh, opportunity, but there is going to be a learning curve. Now, we have a large number, over 100 current hemp farmers. Um, they're all, uh, I, I should say, uh, up to speed, if you will. 
But if we were going to see another wave of interest in hemp farmers, we would ask them to pump the brakes to make sure that they understand what they're about to do and what they're getting into. Just because of the various um, aspects of this plant, it's a very complex plant, um, thus a very complex subject. Thank you. Uh, Senator Drahan. Oh, uh, Senator uh, Putnam, do you have a follow-up? Uh, I do, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So, uh, no, it's fine. So, Mr. Weber, is it safe to say that as a hemp grower, you support this bill? Senator, uh, uh, support, Mr. Weber. Yeah, I support this bill 100% uh, for both the uh, marijuana component of it, but uh, more importantly, the acceptance of hemp mainstream. Thank Senator you, Mr. Weber. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair Champion, and... Uh, and is your mic on? I, I, it is, but I don't... Can you hear me? Hello? It's very low. Is that good? I'm sorry. I think Senator Port did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just, I would never. Yeah. <laughs> um, members, and, and I, I think, uh, Senator Port, this would probably be to one of the testifiers. Um, you know, we've, we've worked on hemp for a few years, and uh, a lot of farmers invested a lot of money trying to trying to grow that industry, um, and and I know the popularity of CBD products has increased and, and taken off. Um, but while we were working through that process, you know, one of the things that um, I think was concerning to some growers is controlling cross-contamination and if we legalize marijuana and hemp is there anything in this 305 page bill that would help protect farmers who have invested in some cases millions of dollars um, in their crop of hemp or marijuana <laughs> and with cross contaminant or cross pollination um, you know, that, that could destroy their crop. So is there anything in here that would help alleviate that? Senator Port. Thank you, uh, Chair Champion and Senator Dreheim, and perhaps uh, the, the growers can weigh in on this as well. Um, that is something that we'll talk about more in the Agriculture Committee. Um, I will say that there are guidelines and standards and studies put in this. Um, I will fully admit I am not a farmer and not a grower and do not understand uh, the cross-pollination pieces, um, but it is something that we are definitely thinking about, having conversations about, and particularly as we continue to have the conversation about the hemp industry and ensuring um, that not only do we protect the current hemp industry, but that the, the new population of farmers and growers that we expect to enter this industry get the education that is necessary. Much of the concern that we heard around the hemp industry when it first started um, was, as Mr. Weber stated, because it was new folks entering the industry and so they didn't know the concerns exactly about cross-pollination, about contamination, things like that. Uh, there is significant investment in this bill to make sure that the new generation of folks that we hope this bill will help enter the industry, particularly from communities who have been hurt from prohibition of cannabis, will have access to that information and education prior to starting their farms so that it won't be something that they have to learn the hard way, uh, but something that we really invest in making sure they understand as they're getting into it. Perhaps Ms. Dawson and Mr. Weber have additional comments. Mr. Weber or Ms. Uh, uh, or Ms. Dawson, do you have any um, additional information that you want to weigh in on briefly? Uh, Ms. Uh, Dawson. Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, and, uh, Senator Champion, I wanted to say that um, I 
my guess is that like all of the other crops that Minnesota farmers grow is that we're going to see some regionalization in certain counties and certain areas of growers who specialize in certain crops. Um, and that you'll find farmers who are marijuana farmers in particular don't like to leave those crops open in open fields. So, uh, and there's other kinds of mitigating um, methods that we use to protect our crops. But I think, uh, especially it's going to be important for farmers to get the right education before they decide to invest so much in those crops. Hopefully we'll get that education out ahead of legalization so that farmers can know what resources to go to. For example, I'm in the northern part of the state. We use uh, certain kinds of hoop house technology that contain our crops in different um, areas, just like, you know, in Minnesota where you have corn, a lot of corn growers in the southern part and you have soybeans on the western part. And I think we're going to see that uh, also with the cannabis industry. Senator Johan, follow up. Thank you, and, and thank you for your testimony there. Um, you know, I, I guess I just caution the members here as we move forward with this. I mean, it's 305 pages or whatever so far, and, and I know it has multiple jurisdictions, and I don't want to take away a lot of our time here um, talking about uh, agriculture and the effects, but it, it does kind of dovetail into what our jurisdiction is a little bit, which is jobs and economic development. And there are a lot of farmers, especially in southern Minnesota, that have invested a lot of money into hemp. And if this is rolled out improperly, it could destroy a lot of communities. Um, so I, I just caution uh, Senator Port, as you move forward, we, we have to uh, unpack some of these issues with the agriculture end of it and, and move forward. But if I could ask one more question. Thank you. Senator Johan. In, and I, to, you know, to be honest, Senator Port, I have not read the entire bill um, yet. Is there anything in here that addresses the banking issues that have plagued Schedule One drugs? Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Champion and Senator Dreheim. Uh, this bill does not prescribe new banking laws. Uh, it is a bill simply to legalize the uh, cannabis industry here in Minnesota. Um, there are significant conversations going on, particularly with our um, credit unions and, and whatnot that are have state charters uh, rather than are federally uh, regulated. Um, but that is not included in this bill. I expect there is other legislation that will happen around that, um, and there are certainly conversations about who will get into it, but it is not addressed in this bill. Uh, Senator Johan, follow-up? Thank you. Um, and, and, and thank you, Senator Port, uh, for your answer. And, and members, once again, I, I caution that we are headed towards uh, another savings and loan type issue if we do not figure out or if the feds do not act on this subject. Um, you know, I, and I think the other thing that I think the misperception is that we're going to collect a bunch of taxes on, on a cash crop that is cash because it is legal to put funds in any federally backed bank. Um, so once again, I, I think it is a little premature to move this bill forward, and, and I hope members um, are, are aware of that issue as we, as we move forward. Thank you. And members, just a, a, a gentle reminder, I don't mind us having a little um, uh, flexibility around what we're talking about, but I want to make sure that I keep us as, as, as focused as possible on what's under our jurisdiction, but I'd like for you to know a little bit about what is going on. So before I get to you, Senator Housley, Senator Nelson had her um, hand up first. Oh, Senator thank, Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, well, to your point, exactly, I was looking at Article 3 and uh, kind of the can startup grants and the financing grants and the na uh, navigation grants and the training grants. And um, that's, I, I, this is the first I've seen the bill. I just want to know one brief thing um, from, from you, Mr. Chair, and then a couple questions for the <laughs> author. Once um, there are some appropriations to attach to this bill, the, this Article 3 is really what's in our jurisdiction here. And will this be coming back to us to really do the deep dive that really this committee needs to do on these new grant programs? So thank you for that question. 
it will not be coming back because there are some appropriations already attached to it and, and cost. And once we get through some of our testifiers, we will just ask the department to come up. Uh, and I believe that we have Devin uh, Baldry that's here. Just talk about uh, those programs that are under our jurisdiction and the money that's been allocated, if that it will cover the cost for doing the work that is prescribed under the uh, bill. Mr. Chair. Uh, Sen uh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, my, my questions will be specifically about these grants. I'm disappointed that we won't have another chance to take a look at them because it's a lot to take in today without really doing the due diligence necessary, especially in the light of things like feeding our future. We want to make sure that that wasn't this, that wasn't this area, but I'm just saying we want to make sure that as grants come forward that we have really done our due diligence to make sure the programs are not are doing what they're intended to do. So um, I'll save my questions for later today after I hear from the department on these thank grants. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, Senator Housley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And my question was along the lines of Senator Nelson since, I mean, I would like to see the bill back here after there are the appropriations because this is the committee where that should all be vetted and it's a 300 page bill that we've just seen now. Um, and there's other bills on the agenda today. It's not nearly enough time for us to go through all of this. So I, I would like to go on the record that we would like to have it come back after appropriations. And, and your point is well taken. We did, and we did send this out some time ago and wanted to really make sure that we gave you as much lead time as possible and pointed you to the specific provisions in this large bill that will, that will really pertain to us. So let's, uh, you know, have an opportunity to talk to the department and others specifically around those things that pertain to us and then let's see how, how, how much uh, ground that we can cover. Senator Nelson. Thank you. One brief question then to follow up. So, um, it, but it would be going to finance. So, I mean, there will be another, there must just be another look. There, there just must. Yes, and, and thank you, Senator Nelson, for that question. Before some of you got in the room, uh, the author did talk about the fact that this bill is gonna make roughly 18 stops, if my, if my memory serves me correctly. One being finance, and a, a, another being ag. So every aspect of this bill that requires uh, um, uh, another committee to touch it will touch it. So it's not going to the floor from here. In fact, it's my understanding that it's going to state and local governments from here. Uh, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just add that um, I would feel better if we had, had a chance to touch it again in your esteemed committee here so we could give it all the due diligence. Thank you, Well, well Mr. thank Chair. you, because I, I love nice touches, but I'm not going to touch this one again. <laughs> so let me just say that for the record. But we'll look at it because I really do want to make sure that you get the information and there's enough places or spaces where I think that we'll be able to uh, flesh out some of these things. And we're going to flesh out some of the things that you wanted to know about Senator Housley around the, the grant programs that are in Article 3. Okay? So with that being said, I'm going to go to Anthony Newby, who's the owner and CEO of Cultivated CBD and board member of U.S. Hemp Roundtable and Minority Cannabis Business Association. Mr. Newby, you'll, you'll be given two minutes, so as soon as you start speaking, we will uh, start our clock. So, uh, so say your name for the record and who you're with and go forward, Mr. Newby. Thank you so much, Mr. Newby. Thank you, Honorable Chair and Committee members. My name is Anthony Newby, and I'm here today to speak on the training and tech support programs um, that were earlier outlined and support the passage of this bill. I own Cultivated CBD. It's a CBD cannabis company based right here in downtown Minneapolis. We've been open for five years. I also serve on boards of directors of the U.S. Hemp Roundtable, U.S. Hemp Growers Cooperative, Minnesota Normal, and an advisory board member for Minnesota Is Ready Coalition. Um, I'm speaking today again from downtown Minneapolis, and uh, why do I share some of these uh, credentials with you? It's not to sell or promote my company, but it's to highlight what's possible for small businesses throughout the state in this industry. My country, my business is a micro version of the massive economic opportunity for all Minnesotans. As for the grant programs, the Can Start, Can Navigate, Can Train programs, these grants, rather than programs that um, may be considered sidebar addendums to legalization, these grants, in my opinion, should be considered um, 
much akin to the support we provide traditional farmers in this state, i.e. corn and soybean farmers. We allocate tens of millions in, in budget appropriations to support those farmers as we should. It's not an equity handout. That's not free money. That's not an unfair advantage. We all understand those are resources necessary to allow our farmers to compete in this state. We all support it. And we ought to do the same with these grant programs as cannabis emerges as an economy. We all see the inequities in this state. Uh, we hear about it. We hear the talk about downtown and it's dangerous and don't drive, don't go to the Mall of America, right? We have all of these um, uh, tensions in the state related to race, inequality, urban rural divide. And this uh, economy offers an opportunity to narrow some of those gaps, but not without support, not without targeted investments like we do, again, in other industries like traditional farming. And these grants often offer an opportunity to do that. I know you all will do your due diligence in the details of those grant programs, but I just want to take a moment to reframe them, not thank as you. equity addendums. Uh, uh, thank you. Major part of the Thank you, Mr. Newby. As I made the invitation earlier, and I'm not sure, Mr. Newby, if you were on the line when I said that I know that there's a lot more wonderful and rich things that you'd like to talk about, uh, make sure if you um, so desire, uh, send us a, a white paper or a letter, and I'll make sure that that, that is circulated to, the, to this wonderful committee, okay? Any questions for the testifier? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Newby. I will now go to Lauren Slothorst. She's the Director of work, uh, Workplace Management and Workforce Development Policy with the Chamber. Uh, is she online? Nope, she's... All right, we will go she on. She submitted a letter. So. Okay. Um, she submitted a letter, and we'll circulate that to you as well. Um, Kara Schultz with the Burnsville City Council. And as she's coming forth, if we could also have John Hoshladen, president of Minnesota Trucking Association, if you would sit beside her. And uh, Senator Port can sit in the middle there. And we'll go in that order. Ms. Schultz, uh, you'll be given two minutes as well. And then Mr. Hoshladen, then you can follow. Please make sure that uh, you... State your name for the record, uh, and you can go forward with your testimony. And you can sign this, the, um, the docket afterwards. There you go. Thank you. Ms. I'm Schultz. quick. I can, I can write quick. You're good. Thank you, Chair and committee members. Uh, I am Kara Schultz, and I own the Flower Pot, a holistic wellness store in Minnesota. And I'm here representing a group of South Metro and South Minnesota farmers and retailers. Uh, I'm also a member of the Libertarian Part of, Party of Minnesota and a member of the Association of Arab American Elected Officials. Additionally, I am a member of the City Council, serving the residents of Burnsville one of the most demographically diverse cities with the highest percentage of naturally affordable housing in the metro area. I'm supportive of the work of this committee to provide economic opportunity for our cities, our businesses, and our residents, because I know in my role as city council member how important training and grants are to existing and new small businesses. And I'd like to offer suggestions for how to improve the bill, specifically areas where the bill impedes the areas of creation and economic development. As presently written, our current businesses, some of whom have been growing, producing, and selling hemp products for years, do not receive priority in getting a license. Grants to foot the estimated 150,000 to 200,000 in new compliance costs, and that's just for small retail stores, or for training. Arbitrarily putting current businesses out of business is not good economic development. Our current businesses are good community partners, they're members of the chamber, and they are families living in our community and our, res our residents and neighbors. If this bi bill wishes to require small family retail stores to have industrial ventilation systems, a minimum of three employees on duty, uh, secured rooms, a $50,000 security system, airlock entries, and the list goes on and on, then I ask 
that current businesses receive priority on license grants, on licensing, and grants to cover those excessive requirements imposed on them by the state with thank the you, same available to Ms. our Schultz. new businesses. Ms. Schultz, thank you so much. Um, uh, again, I'll make the same request of you, and we are going to talk a little more about those grants and, and uh, some of those things in the committee. But you can certainly submit something to the committee, and we'll certainly circulate that because we believe that your concerns should be articulated and shared. Okay? I do appreciate that, and I do have markups on the copy that would allow for removal of some of those requirements so that you would not have to provide those grant monies directly to businesses. Where okay. would you like me to leave them? Uh, one of the pages will we'll come over and get that, and we'll make sure that we circulate that information. Any questions Appreciate for uh, uh, Ms. Schultz first? Uh, Ms. Uh, uh, Senator Port, you have a question or a reaction? Okay. Uh, Mr. Haas, Haas Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm John Hausladen, President of the Minnesota Trucking Association, here to testify in opposition to Senate File 73. We fundamentally believe that Senate File 73 will have a negative impact on our workforce. Minnesota currently faces a shortage of 8,000 professional truck drivers, while the national shortage is 10 times that number. Per federal regulation, truck drivers are prohibited from driving while under the influence of any Schedule I drug. Truck drivers are subject to drug testing, including pre-hire, random, post-accident, and return to work after completing a rehabilitation program. Enacting Senate File 73 into law will not make it legal for persons to consume cannabis and drive a commercial vehicle. However, it will very likely raise the fact that persons will consume cannabis and generate a positive drug test due to confusion and misinformation. And if they have a positive result, they will be relieved of duty, and the odds of that person ever driving again are very low. So let's look further down the road. A person who becomes a recreational user of cannabis under this law may not want to be a truck driver today, but in the future they may, and the cannabis lifestyle will make it nearly impossible for them to ever successfully pass a pre-employment drug test. Does this happen? Well, unfortunately it does. We have already seen in CBD, which in theory should have no THC, people have popped positive. Bad products do make it to the market, and truck drivers have lost their ability to drive while buying what they believed was a safe legal product. I have a member with fleet operations in Minnesota and Colorado, and this member reports that their ability to recruit new drivers in Colorado has become significantly harder due to one issue, cannabis. The applicant simply can't pass the pre-employment test. And a long-term view suggests that our already significant driver shortage will only grow worse if this becomes law. But think about it. This impact will be likely the same on every transportation mode requesting DOT drug testing. Airline pilots, railroad engineers, barge captains, and yes, even Metro Transit drivers. All right, Mr. Hossladen, thank you so much. I know that you have some more that you would like to read. I make the same offer to you. Uh, if you have something, uh, some additional information, you can certainly share it. But let me pause and see if we have any questions uh, um, uh, for the testifier. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Hossladen. Um, you mentioned the, the impact of, of not being able to get enough drivers and, and other transportation workers. In fact, I believe it was the side of HR managers, otherwise known as SHRM, did a study where failure rates have gone from 35% up to as high as 71% in some of these states. But my question to you is, if there's an accident, um, is the, are the drivers drug tested? And if they've been on cannabis, what does that mean? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair? Mr. Haas Layden. Uh, Senator Pratt, yes. If there's ever an accident, the driver is tested uh, it's mandatory, and then the results of uh, that test are revealed, and if cannabis is in the system, they would identify that. Follow-up, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Ho uh, Senator Champion, Mr. Hosslein. So it's fair to say that we could once, so there's only a pre-employment test. Is there any ongoing testing? Because my concern is, um, I'll just admit it, I was randomly drug tested 
on a regular basis when I was in college. We weren't allowed to uh, use marijuana, cocaine, any of that. Um, and I was randomly drug tested on a, on a regular basis. Uh, is there any random drug testing that goes on to ensure that if there is an accident, a driver, a, a railroad worker, a pilot won't have cannabis in their system? Mr. Haas Layton. Mr. Chair, Senator Pratt, yes. So anyone who is DOT mandated to have tests is subject to pre-employment, random, post-accident, and return to work if they are gone through a rehabilitation program. And the thing I would like to add, the challenge of this is most transportation businesses, companies have DOT required employees and contractors and non. And we think one thing that should be allowed by employers as a job issue is to be able to do the same test across your entire workforce so that it's an equitable testing protocol, which would include pre-employment and random, which is not uniformly allowed in the bill right now. And I think one other thing I'd add, Mr. Chair, uh, again, in the purview of this committee, there are a lot of reports that this um, bill requires, but it is seriously weak on the downstream employment impacts. So I think it's gonna do a good job of tracking how many businesses were started and how many employees were added and how many grants were given. Those are all business development. But there is very little that says, but what happens to existing businesses, to productivity, to absenteeism, to workplace accidents? I do think a important place to strengthen this bill is uh, tracking that as well, so as we go down the road, if this becomes law, that we have the full picture. Uh, Senator Draham. Thank you, Chair Champion, uh, and, and thank you for your testimony. I, you know, I think Senator Pratt started down the same kind of line that I was going to go on it, but, uh, you know, as employer, one of the main things we kind of are, are upheld to is our insurance, because we can't operate without our insurance. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've worked uh, in industries where we had a lot of over-the-road uh, em employees and understand the random testing that goes along with that. But can you just touch on how the insurance end would factor in to most businesses? And, Mr. Hossladen, it's going to have to be really brief because that's outside the, the committee's purview, but I wanted to make sure that he at least is given an opportunity to ask the question. So briefly, Mr. Hossladen. Yes, uh, S Senator Champion, S Senator Dram. Uh, fundamentally, any accident that happens impacts your insurance. If there is any incident of uh, being impaired while well, that happens, liability risk goes up the odds of your premiums going up, and the possibility of not being insured go up. Uh, Senator, uh, uh, Senator uh, Putnam, and then we're going to Senator Housley. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Mr. Housley, for your testimony. I, I think it's pretty clear that no one wants an increase in traffic accidents, and no one wants more people doing any part of any job under the influence of anything. Um, now, uh, this question I think is probably for Senator Port in that my understanding is that there are some revisions in testing procedures uh, across the board in lots of different industries uh, in this bill. Uh, would you be willing to some, uh, sort of explain at a high level what some of those changes are and the current, what the status of, of what these changes would be relative to prior testing regimes? Senator Port, to the question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Putnam. Uh, there, there are provisions in this bill uh, that require, if you have a job that uh, has a safety component, if you operate a forklift, if you are responsible for the care of children, uh, if you are sort of things like that, that that fall into the, your job could harm other people. Um, sort of job, there are provisions uh, that allow for testing. What it does not allow for in this bill is for employers to decide to randomly or not randomly test employees for a product that will now be legal. Uh, so that is sort of where, we, where the line is drawn. If you have a, a job currently that like has a safety component, you can still be tested and you can still be prohibited from using cannabis. Um, but if you are just a worker, your boss can't say, I'm going to 
drug test you for a legal substance that can stay in your system for 30 days and then fire you based on that drug test. Um, it's, it's a critical piece of, of the undoing, uh, as, as many of our testifiers talked about, undoing sort of the, um, the ideas and, and the prejudices against the cannabis, people who consume cannabis. Um, I will also say, as far as driving goes, though we will discuss this much more in transportation, uh, alcohol is the outlier for testing on the road. It is the only substance that we have a test for, though the, the thing that's illegal is not driving after you have consumed alcohol, it is driving while impaired. And you can be impaired by many things other than alcohol. And we have tests for those. We have roadside sobriety tests that test whether a driver is impaired. We also have a breathalyzer and blood alcohol test because after years of study, there was a direct correlation between your blood alcohol level and your level of impairment. That is not the case for almost any other substance, no other substance that we have found. Uh, we do have significant money in this uh, bill to continue to work on an oral test that can be given on the road, and we are committed to continuing to work with law enforcement on that, but we know law enforcement can already test for impaired drivers, which is what is against the law. Um, and so that is a, a piece we are committed to because exactly like you said, Senator Putnam, uh, no one wants more accidents. No one wants uh, people to be driving while impaired, which the last piece I'll add is there is also education in this bill, um, especially to young people, but public education in general about the dangers of driving while impaired. Uh, Senator Housley and the others, I want to just remind you all, I'm trying to move us forward so we can get to that Article three, uh, Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have so many questions on what was just said by Senator Port, but I'm going to save those. Um, I will go back to my original question, and it's for you, Mr. Um, House Laden. Uh, you described um, the shortage in truck drivers that you have already and how this would further decrease those, those folks who would want to um, choose this, this route of employment, no pun intended. Uh, but. I was sitting here thinking, uh, we just did a kitchen remodel and the delays in getting product for the kitchen, it took one year to get a refrigerator because they just couldn't get it from point A to point B. What will this bill do to, uh, what, what impact might have it, uh, what might it have on the supply chain? Uh, uh, to the testifier briefly, because this is outside the committee's jurisdiction, but I just will give you 30 seconds to briefly deal with this. Mr. Mr. Chair, Lee. Senator, I think the supply chain is, is jobs. People being at jobs, present at jobs, productivity. And so if productivity is reduced, if people are absent, the piece to create the thing that gets delivered to you is going to be impacted. The supply chain is very flexible and it's very fragile. Uh, Sen uh, okay, Senator Nelson, briefly. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Well, a, a question for um, Senator um, Port. Port, thank you. I was going to give you your first name, Senator Port, uh, briefly, but then to the testifier about the trucking industry. So, uh, just Senator Port, just one brief thing. Uh, when you were talking about impaired driving, and uh, that's been one of the big concerns, I just, uh, is the field sobriety test, which is, we don't have a breathalyzer, uh, but is that, what you see is the field sobriety test uh, functionally. Uh, is that uh, uh, upheld in courts of law? And can they do that test right by the roadside? Uh, Senator Port, and even though this is something that's going to be dealt with in judiciary, is that right? Uh, Senator Port, briefly. Thank you, Chair Champion and Senator Nelson. It's my understanding, yes. Uh, and we will discuss that at length in judiciary, I imagine. Senator Nelson. Mr. Chair, thank you. I just need to get a little bit of clarity on that because that's a pretty important issue. Yeah. Uh, public safety is, 
you know, number one. Um, Mr. Hosladen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, we so appreciate the truckers. Uh, you get goods to market. Uh, and we're, we're just not used to having these supply chain shortages, and we still are. And we really appreciate the truckers who continued uh, trucking even throughout the pandemic and the challenges there. My question is, um, how does this work? Uh, ass assuming that uh, Senator Port's bill passes and uh, marijuana becomes legal in our state, recreational marijuana, how does that work for a trucking company? Because you don't just truck like within Minnesota borders. So I'm assuming your, com your truckers truck all across the nation from state to state. In some states, uh, marijuana is legal, some is not. I don't know, is this going to further impact then your ability to hire people who can not just drive in Minnesota, but other, st uh, other states because, uh, because they're not using uh, marijuana? And, and just due to time, I'll ask you the second question at the same time here. Does this mean, uh, if this bill were enacted in its current state, does this mean, would you have to then I universally test all of your drivers uh, on a like a daily basis. Uh, I'm just wondering how that would Im how making sure that you have drivers who are not impaired with this now legalized um, um, mind altering drug. How would you implement that, and would that mean more testing? I, I just I kind of help, help shed some light on that for me. Uh, um, to the testifier. Uh, and I'm certain that the trucking company deals with this right now because if they're a nationwide company or they drive across many, you know, boundaries, they already have to deal with this. So briefly, because that's outside of our purview, but I still want to make sure that I'm being as thoughtful to our members briefly. Uh, second half, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Nelson. Second question first, it won't change the frequency of testing that is mandated now. So just again to restate, uh, cannabis, THC, marijuana, whatever you want to call it, is prohibited in any form. You can't even just have it in your vehicle. So it doesn't change the legality of it. What it changes is the likelihood that someone is going to be tested positive and not be able to drive. And I would say every state that legalizes recreational marijuana continually reduces the net of potential drivers so that nationwide it is shrinking. Thank you, that's my answer. So last question on this um, issue would be Senator Dreheim before I go forward. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you both. Um, I, I guess a couple comments first. Um, you know, we, last couple years, we had uh, quite a bit of discussion on tobacco and raising the age of tobacco. And yet we had spent millions and millions and millions of dollars every year educating people on the harms of tobacco since I was a little boy, which is a long time ago. Um, so I, 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 I don't think the education piece really helps jobs and what we're doing here when, when it comes to this subject matter. But my, my main question is on the impaired test. So if there is a test out there do you know the name of it? Because I, I think, you know, my my friends that own other businesses would like to become familiar with that test. Um, and is this test proven in the judiciary system? Uh, uh, Senator Port, briefly to that question, because that's something for the judiciary to deal with in real time. But I want to be respectful of of my uh, minority lead. Thank you, Chair Champion and Senator Dreheim. There is not an oral test at this point. There is a field, the field sobriety test that police officers do on the side of the road every day uh, that, would, that tests for impairment and they use for all sorts of substances currently. But, uh, Senator Dreheim. Thank you, but nothing specifically for marijuana. Uh, that I, the research I have done the last year, they, there's stuff that we're working on, but nothing that it, an employer could use that would be on the spot or the law enforcement could use that the courts would back. Is that is that your understanding also? Senator Port. Thank you, Senator Champion. Senator Draham, that's correct. All right. And then one last question that has Senator to do with jobs. Uh, you know, as an employer, um, I, I never had employees over state line, but I, I know um, 
there are many, many, many businesses in, in my district that have multiple locations. H how do you suggest or is there anything in this bill that addresses that multi-state um, issue for, for employers in, in Minnesota? Because I, I go down to Iowa now in my new district. Um, so w would there be anything in here that would help guide our, our businesses? Uh, Senator uh, Port. Thank you, Senator Champion, uh, Chair Champion, and Senator Dreheim. Uh, there's nothing specific to this bill about that. There's businesses that operate across state lines and multiple state lines all, all over the country. Uh, they are used to live, like following the laws in each of those states and jurisdictions that they work in. Uh, this would be exactly the same. So the, uh, the other testifier that we have is going to be Ray Anna Buckholtz. She's a legislative and coalitions director for Americans for Prosperity, Minnesota. Um, so if you introduce yourself for the record, and once you start speaking, we're going to give you two minutes uh, to testify. Go forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, um, members of the committee. My name, as um, the chair mentioned, I, is Rayanna Buckles, and I am the legislative and coalitions director for Americans for Prosperity. AFP believes in a dignified approach to public policy advocating for bottom-up solutions that help every individual achieve their full potential. We also believe in second chances and empowering individuals to use their experiences to make a positive impact for themselves and their community. Senate File 73 is a great example of a transformational measure that will unleash a new market for jobs and economic growth in our state. With regard to certain uh, employment provisions within the bill, such as those listed in Section 19, we would like to see some adjustments that don't exclude such a large number of people from entering the industry. We believe that any type of employment or business restrictions based on criminal record must be for offenses that are directly related to the industry or position itself. We view the language as currently written as an additional barrier to second chance hiring and opportunities in this new industry. In addition, it is our belief that states should neither force nor prohibit employers to complete drug tests. We also recommend that language be added for the Office of Cannabis Management to require an annual market analysis and that there be public input hearings to hear from stakeholders, potential new applicants, and consumers. We view this as vital to ensure another layer of transparency and accountability for this new government agency. Overall, we are very supportive of this legislation and we strongly advise against overly prescriptive regulations that could impose unnecessary hurdles, especially in this market's infancy. The bill should be positioned to legalize the market with appropriate safeguards in place and as we learn what works and what doesn't, then revisit the needs for additional structures. We thank Senator Port for shepherding this legislation through and taking into consideration all of the various stakeholders and individuals impacted. Thank you. Any questions to the testifier? Seeing none, thank you so much. Thank I'm you. going to also ask if Devin uh, Baldry from, from D to come forward. And Mr. Baldry, if you'd be so kind, uh, uh, we know that, that in Article 3, there are grant programs, uh, and I know that Senator Port did speak a little bit about those programs, <laughs> but I'm going to ask you to go through those. And then my second question is going to be, um, whether the money uh, articulated in the governor's proposal reflects what the department needs for this work or not. So let's start with the Can Start program. Can you just briefly tell the committee what that's for? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Devin Bowdry, legislative liaison at DEED. Uh, the Can Starter program, uh, think business financing, um, it looks, I mean, I think Senator Port and Ms. Doyle Fontaine did a good job explaining it. Um, but I'll just say that the language in the bill looks very similar to the Emerging Entrepreneur Loan Program, which is a program that uh, is frankly older than me, so Deed has a lot of experience in, in running that. Uh, right. and, oh, oh, please. Were you going to say something else on that? Oh, I was just going to move to the next program. All right. And the next program, Can Navigate? Can, can you explain yep. a little bit? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can Navigate, uh, think technical assistance, so making sure that uh, businesses are able to receive the education to kind of navigate the regulatory components of starting their business. And last but certainly not least, I believe the other third program is called Can Train. Can you talk a little about that? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Can Train, just uh, doing the full spectrum here is just the workforce development side. So it'd be 
grants either to organizations to help train or grants to individuals to seek that training. And I noticed that in, in the bill uh, that the money for each of those programs is blank, but we also recognize uh, that the governor had put a proposal forward that had money allocated. So maybe we'll start with Senator Port about what's blank there and how we're going to figure out exactly what that dollar amount there. And then Mr. Mr. Uh, Bolger can talk about whether the governor's allocation is what the department needs to fulfill the, the responsibilities articulated in the bill. So Senator Port. Thank you, Chair Champion. Uh, yes, the, the numbers are blank for the moment uh, because we don't have our fiscal note back yet. Uh, we have requested it, we're waiting on it, and we should hopefully have it back soon, but uh, we did not want to move forward with numbers that uh, are not accurate and debate numbers that uh, might not be where we actually need to end up. Um, we are working closely with the agencies to have all of these conversations both individually and sort of together. Um, so we, we feel confident um, um, that once we get that fiscal note, uh, it will be the correct amounts that the agencies need, uh, and we will have that conversation broadly in finance, uh, but we are in continued conversation with the governor's office and the agency heads to ensure that all the pieces that they are required to cover in this bill um, are included in that fiscal note. Uh, Mr. Baldry, to the, the question that I asked. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, in the governor's recommendation, it's 17.1 million across the biennium. Um, you'll see it's not quite uh, split up yet by program, but uh, as we work with Senator Port uh, and others, we'll be able to uh, lay that funding out uh, more directly. But yes, this, this is enough. So, uh, Senator Joheim. Thank you. Uh, could you, how many FTEs then would be uh, in that 17.1, uh, and in the 17.1 just for deed, or is that across the spectrum? Uh, Mr. Baldry, to the question. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dreheim. I would have to get back to you on how many FTEs, um, but 17.1 is the total across all three programs, um, just for deed. Yep. And what I will do, uh, committee, is once that information becomes available for us and is broken down, I will circulate that to the committee and in the event that um, some additional questions are raised and we can figure out what our next steps should be. Uh, Senator Drahan, before I go to Senator Pratt. You know, with the Chair Champion, you know, with this being a finance committee, I, I think we have to have this bill back once we know, F, we don't know FTEs, we don't know hard numbers yet. Um, I, I think it is prudent that we at least uh, spend a few minutes on it when the, the answers are, are there. So can I get your commitment that you will have it back in committee like uh, we're going to do with Pede Family Leave? Um, what, what my commitment will be is that we'll look at the information and we'll certainly talk about it. And if we need to have it back as I committed with Pede Family Medical Leave, that we will get it back in the event that we need to specifically just on the issues before this committee. Because I do want you to have that information. I'm not trying to hide anything or be non-transparent. Uh, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions that may have an impact on a fiscal note, and I'm specifically speaking about um, the uh, uh, the agreements that the the, uh, the agency will be uh, entering into. So it says the the commissioner shall make on, on line 145.13. The commissioner shall make grants that will assist in a broad range of businesses in the legal cannabis industry, including the processing retail sectors. It goes on, and then it says on line 145.18, enter into an, um, that these fo these nonprofits will enter into an agreement with the commissioner that the commissioner shall fund loans that the nonprofit corporation makes to new businesses in the legal cannabis industry, and the commissioner shall review these existing agreements with nonprofit corporations every five years. How did you come up with the five-year uh, time window? Uh, Senator uh, Port. I can defer to uh, my expert and have her introduce herself as well. Identify yourself for the record and go, go forward with the testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Laylee Fadahi. I am the campaign manager for MN is Ready. We are the state of Minnesota's largest and most diverse coalition of cannabis policy stakeholders, 
uh, and we have been working uh, extensively and diligently uh, since the introduction of this bill and before to uh, ensure that the questions you all are raising as well as those of industry or of uh, policy stakeholders are being uh, addressed as this bill moves forward. Senator Port. Thank you, Senator uh, Chair Champion um, and Senator Pratt. These are the same requirements in the emerging, in the, the, the programs that DEED currently runs. Uh, Senator uh, Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I think we've all been uh, very concerned about uh, the fraud that can happen very, very quickly. I know Feeding Our Future started in 2017 and three years later was uh, taking fraudulent grants. And had we waited five years in order to do these reviews, they likely would have been missed. Uh, Mr. Chair, to that point, I would like to offer the A25 amendment. Uh, Senator Pratt offers the A25 amendment. And I can, I can uh, explain it, Mr. Chair, uh, very quickly while it's being passed out. It simply changes the every five years on line 145.20 and 145.21 to annually. And I wanted to get this out as we were talking about uh, the fiscal note to make sure that uh, an annual review was, was properly reflected in the, in the agency's review of, of the costs. Uh, that is uh, the, the author's explanation. Senator, Senator Port, your thoughts about the um, amendment, the A25. Thank you, Chair Champion and members. Uh, I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Uh, in the current programs that DEED runs, they are in consistent contact. There are many other reports that are due. Uh, this is just the, the re-up of the agreement with these businesses. It is not the only reporting that's required. And respectfully, uh, I ask for a no vote. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Senator Port. Well, we're delving into some new areas and some new businesses. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, uh, due to the banking regulations at the federal level, what typically is more of a cash business. And I've, I have a, a background of about a decade working in fraud and fraud prevention uh, for a couple of large financial institutions here in the city. And, and what I do know is that these are businesses, cash businesses tend to be more susceptible to fraud and money laundering and, all, and, and other types of, of uh, issues. While I think it might be appropriate for longstanding uh, nonprofits uh, to be reviewed every five years, I think when we're talking about a new, a brand new section of law that uh, has, one, been deemed uh, illegal for, for decades, two is pr predominantly a cash business, um, and three, given what we've seen most recently with CCAP and Feeding Our Future, we should be looking at these businesses more and these nonprofits more regularly. We can always come back and reestablish it at five years, but we get one shot, one shot to take a look at these, at these new applicants to determine whether or not they are uh, legitimate and they're doing business in a legitimate way. And I think it gives the department an opportunity to um, practice and, and refine the procedures for doing the audits and reviews on an ongoing basis. So I, I think this, I was hoping this would be a friendly amendment uh, because it's really so common sense that um, we don't want fraud and criminal activity to go undetected with state funds being lent out. All right, Senator Nelson, and then I'll go to Senator Putnam. Uh, thank you, M Mr. Chair. And, and I wanted to uh, speak to uh, Senator Pratt's amendment uh, and again ask that this be uh, um, be adopted for all the reasons that he so eloquently stated. But in addition to that, um, we are not only dealing with a cash business, a new business, we must not forget that uh, this is um, illegal under the federal government. F, it is a Schedule I drug. It will remain a Schedule I drug. We don't know for how long, but it currently is. And I think that that in and of itself 
is reason enough because of all of the um, connections uh, that could be made there because it's such a new, um, a new industry, and I must say I'm a little concerned about us um, funding a new uh, industry that is illegal under federal standards, I must say. But so I would encourage um, a yes vote on this very minimal, just asking for some further, uh, some annual oversight. And I would say on feeding our futures, I think it was the federal government who was monitoring that money, who saw that fraud. And thank goodness they were watching that. But I think we need to be watching here in Minnesota. So I would um, ask for a support of Senator Pratt's amendment. Uh, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, th there is a, a potential intersection with corollary industries, I suppose. I mean, clearly this is a radically different circumstance than feeding our future. But are there other businesses or other industries that require uh, similar reporting? I guess this question is for Mr. Beaudry. Uh, uh, in terms of deeds reporting with other industries, other things, clearly it's a little bit different because of the cash factor. Um, but uh, what would the impact be on deed to require a yearly versus a five-year um, uh, 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 reporting Senator, experience? I'm sorry. Are you okay? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on you there. Uh, Mr. Bouldry, to the question. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Putnam, uh, the five-year language is, is language that mirrors the Emerging Entrepreneur Program, so that's how we usually do it. Um, we're, with all of our grants, with all of our loans, we're always in constant communication with these partners. Uh, we're always doing uh, administration, site visits, various things to administer. All right, uh, Senator Draheim, to the motion before, oh, and, and then Senator Pratt. Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Champion and Senator Pratt for bringing this motion forward. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's been said directly, but uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm a little concerned about organized crime a little bit in, in this area, uh, at least initially. And I, I think it's once again, good governance to have some reporting, um, so I, I, I'm a strong yes on this amendment. Um, and after a few years, if we need to push it out, we definitely can come back and, and do that. Um, and then I, I think we should roll call this one, Chair. Roll call has been requested, roll call granted. Uh, Senator, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Before I make my closing comments, uh, I also was going to ask for a roll call and request that the results of the roll call be printed in the journal. Uh, request granted. Any additional questions? I believe it takes three hands. Oh, two. <laughs> well, that's why. Well, I knew at least your three hands were going Mr. to be. Mr. Chair. So, uh, anything else? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to. I want to refocus the the discussion here. Um, a little bit to, to correct my, uh, my colleagues, Senator Putnam and Senator Dreheim. I'm not asking for a report. What I'm asking for is a review of the agreements with the nonprofit corporations and allowing, if there's, if there's something wrong, the commissioner to terminate the agreement. And let me just talk about what some of those reasons are, Mr. Chair. Uh, it makes sure that um, I'm getting my pages mixed up here, excuse me. Um, the nonprofit has a board of directors that includes citizens experienced in business and community development, new business enterprises, and creating jobs for people facing barriers to education and employment, that they have the technical skills to analyze projects, they're familiar with the available public and private funding sources and economic development programs they can initiate and implement economic development projects. They can establish and administer a revolving loan fund. Mr. Chair, uh, they work with job referral networks to assist people facing barriers to employment. Uh, they establish relationships where long-term residents are eligible for social, social equity, to be social equity applicants. Mr. Chair, these are all things that go to the integrity of the program. This is not a report. They're not reporting back to the legislature. This is giving the commissioner the authority because it says, if I go down to line 14529, loans must be made to businesses that are not, are not likely to undertake the project for which the loans are sought without assistance. Must is a very high bar. Must does not say that there's a decision point that the commissioner has. 
Musk says that, that, that they must, in fact, honor that request. And if we are going to force these loans to be made, then we should make sure that on a more frequent basis, and I would say annually, that those programs are being reviewed to find out who those loans are being made to. So I'm really not trying to stall the bill here, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to put some, some teeth behind it because I, I am very concerned, ba again, based on my experience in fraud and fraud prevention, to make sure that this is a, a program that runs in a very lawful way and public monies are not going to be defrauded or used in a way that's not intended by the commissioner. And the only way we can do that is by doing a review. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Brett. Uh, 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 Mr. Baldry, uh, didn't you say that, that reviewing agreements continuously is already a part of the process or at least a part of the process f uh, for the program that you modeled uh, this, this program after or, dis or did I misunderstand that? Mr. Chair, no. Uh you have it correct. And uh, sometimes we do uh, renew these uh, agreements earlier. Um, with Emerging Entrepreneur, we've done it after two years before. So up to five years is pretty uh, standard. Uh, Senator Pratt. I mean, uh, uh, Senator Port. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a few things I want to clear up. First of all, uh, these are loans that are run through nonprofits that do this work already in a bunch of industries. Uh, there might be new ones that emerge, but these exist already. Uh, they are not loans that are going to be given directly from deed to the businesses, that the cannabis businesses. They are to a nonprofit that helps these businesses get started. Um, so I want to clear that up for one. Um, two, as Senator Pratt pointed out, these are not studies. Uh, there are studies in Article One of the bill. Uh, I encourage you to read that at some point, or I'm happy to talk through it with you. Uh, it is not sort of relevant at this moment, but there are significant studies uh, that are required consistently every year. Um, third, licenses of the businesses that will be engaged in every single part of the cannabis industry, there are 14 different kinds of licenses at this point, are annually re required to be renewed annually. So there are many checks in many different places. Um, to uh, Senator Pratt's point on 145.29, that is not saying that, a lo that loans must be given. It is saying who they must be given to. The loans must be given to businesses that are not likely to undertake this industry without the loan. It's not saying that you are required to give the loan. It's saying if you are giving a loan, this is whom you must give it to. Um, so again, respectfully ask for a no on this amendment. Thank you. All right. Uh uh, 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 Senator Pratt, briefly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you, Senator Port. And, and you touched on a couple of the issues that I have, I have concerns with. You know, if we were talking about guaranteeing these loans through the financial system where it is highly regulated, in fact, many of our banks have uh, regulators on site continuously. Uh, you know, I know, I know many of our larger banks have uh, OCC, FDIC uh, examiners on site year round, every day, uh, every year. And, you know, I can only look at the, at the language on 145.29 to say that the loans must be made, not, sh you know, not may be made or shall be targeted, but they must be made. Uh, I just believe, uh, Mr. Chair, that when we're talking about a new industry, when we're talking about potentially new nonprofits, that we have no experience with, that this is a very reasonable <coughs> and necessary uh, change. And I request a yes vote. And we understand that roll call has been requested. Just for clarity, members, 145.23 to 145.24 talks about the criteria in the subdivision applies to loans made by the corporation. So a nonprofit corporation, I just want to refocus that, us on that. All right, so uh, the secretary will take the roll. Chair Champion. No. Vice Chair Mohammed. No. Ranking Member Dreheim. Yes. Senator Gustafson. No. Senator Haas, her. No. Senator Housley. 
Senator Pratt. Yes. Senator Putnam. No. Senator Nelson. Yes. There being three yes votes uh, or ayes and five noes, the motion does not prevail. Any other questions? Now remember, members, this bill is going to go uh, uh, to state governments, and, and, and because there's a fiscal issue, we will certainly more than likely have it come back so that we can deal with the fiscal issues that applies to this committee. I was hoping that we had a fiscal note, but that's only fair. Uh, and Senator Muhammad, motion for this particular, uh, briefly, because we do have some other bills that we have to get through today, members, as well. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, I was hoping we would be able to fully vet this bill. Uh, my question uh, is on um, <clears throat> Section 9, Subdivision 2, on page 185. And I'm looking specifically at... Uh, the new language on section 185.10 through 185.15. Um, this may go to some of the questions that we had for Mr. Hosslein earlier, or, or maybe somebody from Sherm if they're here. It says, nothing in this section shall be construed to limit an employer's ability to discipline or discharge an employee for cannabis flower uh, impairment, blah, blah, boom, 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 during working hours on working premises or while operating an employer's vehicular machinery or equipment. And Mr. Chair, my concern is that there are certain jobs where these tests must be, um, must be performed, and we have to know, because there is, no, there is no certainty on how affected someone is when they have THC in their system. It can stay in their system for up to nine weeks. And so, uh, Senator Pratt, we certainly understand that, and that's something that we talked about earlier today when you were not in here, that that is an issue that's going to be dealt with either in labor and or um, um, uh, judiciary. That is outside the bounds of this committee, and I'd I, I've given us a whole lot of time, and we do have four other bills to get to. Uh, this bill will come back to us, but I'm sure that you're in some of those other committees that it's going to go through. You are in, because there's, there's 18 stops. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're not on any of those other stops, I don't know where you're going to be. But uh, a, a, a finance is one that you're, you're going to be in, right? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. If, if I may, I'd love to be in some of those other stops, but uh, the minority wasn't given enough committee slots in well, order for us to be in those slots. Well, well, Mr. Chair, uh, 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 Mr. Uh, Senator Pratt, we are not going to get into that debate, right? Uh, so with that being said, um, it will come back. It, it uh, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of discussion about this. I just want to make sure that the committee's time is used for our jurisdiction. And, and I recall you, when you were chair, making this a real issue when it comes to jurisdiction. Senator Pratt, did, did you have a question? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, is, is the jurisdiction of this committee, if, if I understand right, uh, labor is a policy committee, and the Department of Labor budget and OSHA is under the jurisdiction of this committee. Am I no. mistaken? No. Mistaken. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're nothing. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Herb. is is all the testify? You're done with all the testify. I'm sorry. Are you done with all the testify? I am. Okay. May may I add one little tiny thing? As as a member, but some an element that you know is was not presented in, in this committee, um, and that is that um, you know being that agriculture is part of my heritage and background as well, and uh, uh, I know that this, this package will create jobs, you know, for sure, and not for business owner as well as those who are an assembly line worker that English is not their necessarily their uh, primary language, so this will help create job in that level because I know harvesting cannabis takes time and uh, takes trimming of the, the cannabis flower as well. So. That is manual labors that will be benefiting to those who not necessarily use English as their first language. 
that's all I want to share. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and remember, this is going to come back. Uh, and, and committee, I'm going to ask us to go a little beyond 230 because we do have to try to get through those other bills as well. Senator Muhammad has a motion. Mr. Chair, I request a roll call. Okay, so, so no, so, so she was prepared for her roll call vote on the other thing. She's ready. So Senator Muhammad moves that the, uh, uh, that Senate file uh, 73 be recommended to pass and, and, and re referred to state and local governments. Did you ask for a roll call? She, uh, uh, she did ask for a roll call, but I'm not sure if she wants a roll call. You want a roll call on the vote? Uh, Okay, there it go. Roll call has been requested. Roll call granted. All right. So, um, absolutely. So uh, the uh, secretary will will take the roll, or I should say, the committee administrator, a committee legislative assistant, will take the roll. Yes, Chair Champion. Yes. Vice Chair Mohammed. Yes. Ranking Member Dreheim. No. Senator Gustafson. Yes. Senator Herr. Yes. Senator Housley. Senator Pratt. No. Senator Putnam. Yes. Senator Nelson. No. There being five yeses, or oh, ayes, and three noes, that the motion uh, prevails. All right, members. Oh, I got to give you that back. We're going to now go to uh, uh, Senate File 359, uh, Senator Muhammad. And and uh, 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 to our testifiers, uh, uh, we know that you would certainly have a lot to say, but we hope that you can make it very brief, but to the point. Uh, and, and these bills will be laid over for possible inclusion. Senator Muhammad, well, welcome to your committee. And uh, when you are prepared, um, uh, go forward with, with your introduction for Senate File 367, uh, 359. Sorry about that. Awesome. Uh, Chair Champion, members of the committee, thank you for considering this legislation today. This is Senate File 359, which appropriates $850,000 over two years to Better Futures Minnesota. Better Futures is a nonprofit in South Minneapolis that focuses on reducing recidivism by providing job, uh, job training and workforce development for formerly incarcerated Minnesotans. Better, Future, uh, Better Futures works in landfill waste diversion building maintenance, lawn care, snow removal, and appliance, uh, and appliance re uh, recycling. In other words, they serve the public good. Before I get any further, I want to say that I'm here presenting this bill today for two reasons. One, I believe that everyone deserves a second chance. And two, we know that reducing recidivism makes our community safer and economy st stronger. This bill achieves both of those. Better Futures has had a Im positive impact on the community and their success in reducing recidivism and helping formerly incarcerated Minnesotans reintegrate re into society as a parent. And I'm excited to have two testifiers from Better Futures today, P.J. Hubbard, the executive director, and Tino Jones, a, formerly, a former participant in the program who's an employee at Better Futures today. I look, for, I look forward to hearing their testimonies, and I welcome questions after we're wrapped, wrapped up with the bill introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Muhammad, for those comments. And we're going to ask your testifiers to uh, keep their comments to two minutes each. I'm sorry we, we just pressed for time. We understand the richness of this program, and you all have been doing a lot of good work. But with that being said, I'm going to start with um, P.J. Hubbard, who is the Executive Director of Better Futures Minnesota. Um, if, you test, if you will state your name again for the record and go forward with your two-minute testimony. Thank you, Chair Champion, Senator Muhammad, Senators, um, P.J. Hubbard representing Better Futures Minnesota. 
Better Futures of Minnesota embraces a population of men who are locked out of society, living in chronic poverty, with histories of incarceration, persistent unemployment, untreated mental illness, addiction, and homelessness. Our workforce development social enterprise provides 12 trainings and certification, on-the-job training, and employment for men that we serve coming out of incarceration. Most of our men have little to no work experience, and for some, employment with better futures represents their first full-time job. As convicted felons, they are often locked out of employment opportunities. Better Futures of Minnesota is focused on breaking down barriers to employment through intensive trainings, on-the-job training, job placement, and support services. Our support services include, but are not limited to, housing support to reduce homeless, homelessness and increase stabilization, transportation support to reduce barriers to gainful employment, mental health support to address long-term trauma, chemical health support to address long-term addiction, birth certificate and state, identifi state identification support, and on. In 2021, 106 men completed approximately 29,000 on-the-job hours, on-the-job training hours in our business lines, and we ended the year with a 5% recidiv recidivism rate. Chair Champion, Senator Mohammed, Senators, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today, and I am extremely proud of Tino Jones, who is beside me to share his personal testimony. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Hubbard, and thank you for that very targeted testimony. I sincerely appreciate that. Um, uh, Tino uh, Jones, we're going to ask you to say your name for the record. You've got to lean into the mic because we want to make sure that we hear your two-minute testimony. Uh, Mr. Jones, go ahead. All right. Thank you, uh, Chair Champion, and thank you, Senator Muhammad, and thank you all other senators. My name is Tino Jones, and I came to Better Futures in 2018. I mean, I was lost. I needed some structure. I needed some guidance. Better, fe better Futures have provided me with everything that I came looking for, from on-the-job training to all my certificates and steady employment. So what I'm saying is that Better Futures is where it is I needed to be. I started off as a participant. And I went from crew chief, crew chief in training, to supervisor, assistant uh, manager, and now I'm the business manager of uh, my warehouse and appliances and sales. I have stable housing. I'm married now. I own my home. Me and my wife own our home in Burnsville. This was the best decision I ever made by coming to Better Futures. Thank you all very much for letting let me testify. Thank you for that wonderful testimony. Any questions to the testifiers? Senator uh, Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, just a brief comment. Um, what a wonderful testimony. And, I, and also, you answered my question, 5% recidivism rate. That's huge. That's phenomenal. I just uh, really am pleased for the lives that are being changed here. Prior to my time in the Senate, I served on the board for Rochester Network for Reentry. Uh, so we have followed these things. Now it's called Next Chapter Ministries. But I uh, look forward to learning more about this program. But it, it sounds like it is changing lives. Any other questions to the, to the testifiers? Seeing none, we, uh, uh, this bill will be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you so very much for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. I was waiting for Umu verbatim, but I'm going to go forward because we want to make sure that we, we are uh, making good use of the time. We're now going to go to, to my Senate file 367, and Senator Muhammad will take over. Uh, 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 Mr. Johnson, all the others, come to the table, please. Good afternoon, committee. Uh, thank you so much for hearing this important bill, Senate File 367. This bill is affectionately known as Mind the Gap Bill. And I have with me some wonderful testifiers. We understand that, the, um, uh, that we are pressed for time, but we believe that we have more than enough time to substantively deal with why this bill 
uh, should be uh, a part of the omnibus bill. So, so sitting next to me is, uh, actually he's a pastor, Pastor David Johnson. He's also a bishop, really. And he is also uh, the main architect and visionary around this program. Uh, and, and he's going to tell us about uh, Mind the Gap and the work that they've been doing. Uh, Mr. Bishop Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Champion, and to the rest of these uh, senators that are present uh, with this committee. I am David E. Johnson. I am the president and CEO of Mind the Gap, and it's an honor to be here. We are located in the west suburb of Minneapolis, and we're here to discuss uh, this particular Senate file 367. Established in 2017 with the mission of creating pathways for individuals to close the gap to prosperity, Mind the Gap is a multifaceted workforce development organization created to improve the quality of life employed for underemployed and underemployed individuals, primarily African-American Minnesotans. We believe that Mind and Gap has mission has, is closing the gap to prosperity, most impacted by offering innovative programming that intentionally engages participants holistically, built on the premise that work transforms lives, Mind and Gap provides direct access to credentialize Class A commercial driver's license CDL training. We believe that Mind the Gap is associated with other organizations, and one in particular we've lift a note from, which is a, according to the Minnesota Trucking Association, we've noted that 5,285 truck drivers will be a deficit in the years to come. We've also noted that within the next year to a year and a half, that over one million truck drivers will be replaced with those that are retiring to keep the projects and demand going. Mind the Gap has created the four major programs. One is housing support services, the other is financial literacy and stability, the other is uh, job placement services, and our flagship is Driving Beyond Barriers, our CDO training program. With this program, we've served close to 367 participants throughout our years of service, and we believe that we can continue to advance and keep Minnesota moving forward. We recognize in my closing statements that, as has been stated already today, that Minnesota has had challenges with getting items to our doors because of trucking delays. We understand that with this particular appropriation that we can employ over 100 participants in our program to help move Minnesota forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Bishop Johnson. Uh, and as you know from uh, uh, looking at uh, Senate File 367, we're asking for $750,000 in fiscal year 2024 and $750,000 in fiscal year 2025. Our second uh, testifier will be Antoine Currenton, who, uh, who will give us a brief two-minute statement as well. And he's going to speak directly into that mic because we want to hear everything that he has to say. <laughs> Good afternoon, greetings, Mr. Chair, and the members of the committee. Or oh, Madam Chair, because she's oh, in the chair. Madam. Oh. Madam Chair. Madam yeah. Chair. <laughs> All right. My name is Antoine Curitan. I have been privileged to have gone through the Mind the Gap Driving Beyond Barriers program in which I successfully completed both the CDL Class B and the Class A commercial driver license programs they offered. A little about myself. I'm originally from Chicago, Illinois, and I moved to Minnesota in 2005. Okay, in 2005, to try to find more stability financially for me and my children. Before pursuing my CDL license, I was a machinist, and I was looking to get into the trucking field. When I heard about Mind the Gap through the Twin Cities rise, needless to say, I was hooked on the idea of the opportunity to not only gain employment, but obtain a CDL credential, which could change me financially. I attended the Driving Beyond Barriers program in 2018, pursuing a career utilizing a Class B driver license. Mind the Gap's staff was dedicated in me and helping me obtain my Class B permit and my birth certificate and my DOT physical as well. After receiving my license, I worked for a waste manager earning then 40,000 a year in 2018 and ending in 49,000 a year in 2021. The beauty of having this license is that during the pandemic, I was able to keep employed, employment 
when more than half of America wasn't able to. I recently completed the CDL Class A program at Mind the Gap, and I am scheduled for an interview at DLI Logistics, a trucking company I met at one of the lunch and learn meetings Mind the Gap schedules us for while we we're in the training for our permits and pre-trip inspection. They offered all of us in my cohort driving positions starting wages of 65000 a year, four benefits after the first 30 days of employment, and a $10,000 sign-on bonus pay out quarterly over the year. I am confident in getting the job because I have been working with the staff at Mind the Gap on updating my resume and doing a few mock interviews. My next step is to get, to get into the financial literacy course they offer so I can purchase my first home. Thank you. Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity for my testifiers to testify and we'll stand for any questions. Mem uh, thank you, Senator Champion. Members, any questions for Senator Champion and his testifiers? Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to uh, commend you on your story, sir. It's, it's, it's a really you, great story and, and uh, one I think that helps us in this committee know that we're not just you know, giving money out, but we're actually having a real impact on lives. And we have a real shortage, you know, as we've talked about supply chain, we've had a real shortage of truck drivers and I'm hoping we can do even more uh, to speed up the timeline between uh, when you're able to graduate with your CDL and the time that we can actually get you employed and on the road, because I know there is a little bit of a gap between uh, the final testing, but uh, congratulations to you. It's never easy to take that step, and uh, I just want you to know how much I respect your efforts in that. Thank you, sir. All right, and what I will say is that there is a sheet in your packet, or at least it should be, uh, that covers Mind the Gap and gives you background and all that other information. So thank you so much, committee. Any additional questions? Any other questions? All right, we will lead this bill over to the omnibus bill. Thank you, Chair Champion. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Senator, remove verbatim. You can come forward, as well as any testifiers. Thank you, Senator Umu Verbaden, and your testifiers. Um, we uh, Now before the committee is Senate File 555. 557. 557, I'm sorry. I, I, I was looking right at it, and I knew it was 557. <laughs> All right, Senator Verbaden. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee um, for this opportunity to present Senate File 557. This bill is a one-time appropriation uh, from the Workforce Development Fund to DEED for a grant to the International Institute of Minnesota. It's 550,000 fiscal year to, uh, 2024 and 550,000 fiscal year 2025. This is to support workforce training for new Americans. The International Institute of Minnesota is located on Como Ave in St. Paul, across from the State Fair. The Institute has been welcoming new Americans to our community for more than 100 years. The Institute helps new Americans, refugees, and immigrants actualize their talents and ambitions through high quality education and employment programs, uh, immigration services, and refugee settlement supporting new arrivals to our community. In the last year, the Institute welcomed over 400 Afghan and Ukrainian arrivals by finding housing, employment, and ongoing critical services that help new Americans have a strong start to their new lives in Minnesota. The Institute's medical careers pathway was recognized by the Department of Labor under the Obama administration on their top 10 workforce training programs in the United States. Healthcare and other employers rely on the Institute graduates who are hardworking and committed employees who are providing valuable healthcare at all levels in or community. This is a wonderful program, and um, I urge you all to support this bill, but I'll um, let our testifiers share a little bit more about the Institute and what they do. Senator Umu Verbaden, thank you so very much for that, that wonderful testimony. Is there any particular person that you want to go first? Um, Chair, 
Chair Champion, uh, <laughs> Senator Omo Verbaten, and members of the committee. I'm Jane Grotman, the Executive Director of the International Institute of Minnesota. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, Senate File 557 will support the Institute's medical careers pathway that will help clients reach entry level positions in healthcare and then help them advance into a higher paying position that stabilizes their families. The Institute's Medical Careers Pathway has trained and employed over 3,100 healthcare workers employed in 10 hospitals and 125 long-term care centers in our community. Since 2000, 2,500 have become nursing assistants and 667 Pathway students have advanced their careers, the majority of them earning their four-year and two-year RN degrees while others have become LPNs and other advanced positions in healthcare. The current average wage for college degree RNs is $45 per hour. Also, Institute graduates have an impressive retention rate. Nursing assistant graduates from the Institute have a 90% one-year retention rate, and nurses have almost 100% one-year retention rate. And lastly, I would just say from 2016 to 2017, 97% of new workers in, our, in the state of Minnesota were immigrants. So they are key to the, uh, the, they are critical to the economic vitality of the state economy. And we want to make sure that they move swiftly and seamlessly through their pathways to advanced degrees in healthcare. So thank you. And I will now pass with pleasure um, the floor to Blessing Agayeto. Welcome to the committee. We say your name for the record and go forward. Thank you, Chair Champion, Senator Mulvayton, and committee members. My name is Blessing Aguieto, and I'm a registered nurse, a student pursuing my doctorate of nursing practice, and a board member at the International Institute of Minnesota. I came to Minnesota from Nigeria in 2000. Since arriving in the US, I've pursued my educational goals with clear vision and passion. I attended North Hennepin Community College to complete my two year degree in nursing, which I completed in 2018. While I was working towards my associate degree at North Hennepin, I joined the Medical Careers Pathway Program through the International Institute. This program provided critical academic and employment guidance and scholarships throughout my college education. While I was attending nursing school, I worked as a CNA at North Memorial Hospital after graduation, I was hired at North Memorial on their oncology unit and later transitioned into their emergency department in 2020. While in school, I worked hard to achieve my goals and pursue my passion for nursing while also tutoring other students who are pursuing their dream of becoming a nurse. Now as a nurse, I assist immigrant nursing students as a volunteer tutor with the medical careers program at the institute. I was fortunate to be able to be part of this program during my associate's and bachelor's degree, which I completed in December of 2020. This continued education has allowed me to continue the learning and applying advanced nursing concepts to my job as a nurse. My career goal is to work as a nurse practitioner, and I'm currently enrolled um, at the graduate student program at Winona State University. I hope to work as a family nurse practitioner and eventually open my own clinic that supports underserved and geriatric communities. The Institute provides tuition assistance, academic and career guidance, economic empowerment courses, and well-rounded support for new Americans like me who wish to advance their medical careers and become the next generation of leaders in Minnesota as far as healthcare is concerned. With the financial knowledge I gained at the Institute, I was able to buy a home in 2020. I am grateful for the assistance and support the International Institute has provided me. From yeah, your time is up, but do you have one more line? I do. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna let you have that last line. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I hope you will all support this bill to help others like me. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to let my voice be heard. All right, thank you so very much. Thank you for your testimony. Any questions to the testifiers? Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, I know many of us have had a chance to tour the uh, uh, in, um, the uh, Institute and the good work that they're doing and the training that they're they're doing and I want to just uh, congratulate our testifier for finding the soft spot in your heart. Thank you very much. <laughs> very, very generous to her. <laughs> what he's really saying that translation is 
We didn't think he had a soft spot in his heart, but you found it. <laughs> so thank you, Senator Pratt. Uh, Senator uh, Nelson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to uh, commend you for what you've accomplished so far. I'm uh, highly supportive of this bill, particularly the medical careers. There's such great, great opportunities great uh, vertical opportunities uh, there. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chair, I know you've been supportive in the past of Bridges to Healthcare, which is a similar type medical pathways. Uh, there is a bill this year as well. So I'm hoping there's a place on your agenda for that. But again, congratulations. Well done. Uh, thank you to the testifiers. And thank you, uh, Senator uh, uh, Umu Verbaden, for bringing this important information. Uh, and yes, Senator uh, Nelson, there is always room for us to hear um, about those other uh, uh, initiatives and great work that's being done. Uh, lastly, Senator Herr, before we lay this bill over for possible inclusion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the testifier. Thank you, um, Ms. Grubman. And, uh, um, Please speak into your mic, Senator. Uh, yep. Thank you to the testifier and also Senator Umu uh, Verbendum for bringing this bill. I can attest to, uh, you know, like new American or, or immigrant is continue coming to our country. Uh, some are, you know, uh, many are from uh, war-torn country, as we're going to expect for some already maybe from Ukraine and, uh, uh, let's see, Afghanistan for sure. And so, I, you know, when I think about International Institute, I also think back to the days in the, in the early 80s when uh, my people came and it was the International Institute that, you know, uh, helped get our elders, our adult into the workforce. So I just want to put that on the record. And I will say it again and again when, on, uh, on this story, when every time when International Institute uh, come on board. And so it keep on helping new American each time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much. Seeing no additional questions, Senate File uh, 557 will be laid over for, for possible inclusion. <laughs> Members, thank you so much. That concludes our business for today. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we know that the other bill will come back. Um, we will also get an agenda out to you so that you'll know exactly what we're doing on Wednesday. And if you have anything else that you want me to know, please feel free to contact us because we <laughs> want to be as thoughtful uh, 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 for this committee. So thank you so much. And uh, the Committee on Jobs and Economic Development or Economic Growth is adjourned. <laughs>